The traditional first anniversary is paper. The 15th is crystal. The 23rd is a kidney. It was a bit overwhelming, but there was no stopping getting the help that he needed. And I wasn't going to stop that. I was going to do everything I can. That's living donor Tracy Gonzalez. I'm Sarah Jane Castro, Senior Director of Marketing and Communications for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois, and your host for this edition of The Journey Continues. Tracy, tell us how you met Tony. I met Tony 25 years ago at our job. We worked together. I was uh, the secretary and he was the electrician at a adult and children's services with disabilities. So I was the secretary and he was the electrician and maintenance manager. He redid the houses and everything. So I met him through work 25 years ago. (laughs) What drew you to him? He was big (laughs) and had (laughs) lots of tattoos and he had that bad boy look. And (laughs) I guess that's what attracted me to him. (laughs) (laughs) What about you, Tony? What drew you to Tracy? Well, uh, you know, when you're at a a job, a facility, and there's a ton of people, you know, everybody has their attraction, and she stood out. You know, amongst all of them, I I was attracted to her, but uh, she was in a different department, and I didn't want to, you know, push anything. So I just kept it quiet, so to speak. And I'm not a quiet guy. Those workplace romances can be tricky if one party's not interested also. That's correct. So you fall in love. Obviously, you're you're on the same page. What kinds of things do you like to do together once you start dating and, and once you're married? Well, I'll tell you a quick story. So I go to pick her up for a date. So I pull up on my motorcycle because I want it to be known that this is a big part of my life and I'm not going to change it for anyone. So I pulled up. She said she didn't get in on that. I drove off. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> it was kind of a little awkward the next day, I think it was, or something, but we worked it out. And she got on, and she's been riding her own for 20 years. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, that's quite a shift from I'm not getting on that motorcycle to I've got my own. You tend to adapt once you learn that something that he loves so much. You tend to love it yourself, you know, once you take in accountability that, okay, he loves this, that I'm going to learn to love it too. And I ended up loving it myself where I ride my own and I never ride on the back with him now. <laughs> I, I prefer to be on my own motorcycle now. <laughs> so. so, Tony, when did you learn that you had kidney disease? It was 2001 and uh, I wasn't feeling good and I noticed my legs swelled up, and of course, I thought I was, I was eating too much salt. You know, that's what everybody tells you. Oh, you eat too much salt. Cut down on the salt. So then they didn't go away. So I had to go see a doctor, and uh, so Tracy set up a doctor's appointment for me. My general doctor, she was out of on vacation, I believe. So I seen this other doctor, Doctor Chow. He just looked at my records, and when he came in, and the blood work. Didn't even see my legs yet. And he goes, I think you have kidney failure. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? And then he looked at my legs. He says, yeah, you need to see a specialist. So I went to see her and they told me I had to go on dialysis right away. I couldn't believe it. How did you feel when they told you your kidneys were failing and you were going to have to go on dialysis? You know, I was scared. I was like, you know, how did this happen? What did I do? I probably shouldn't eat that. Or I had no knowledge because, you know, of course you don't, research or do anything until something happens to you or somebody in your family. So I started researching because that's what I do. Come to find out, I was having a kidney issue, but the way the doctor explained it, you know, I go in, I fill a jug up, I turn it in, they check it, and I'll see you next year, watch the salt. Okay. That's why I assumed it was the salt. And then when they told me I had to go to dialysis, and then they told me it had to be three days a week for five hours. And I think the first time I had to do it multiple times, one after the other, my legs went down right away and everything. But I was very tired. And anybody who's been to a Dallas place, it's a real dreary place. It's a real sad place. A lot of older people, people crying. There were diabetics. They lost a leg. 
I'm sitting there, I'm wondering, is this going to happen to me? Am I going to lose my leg? Because I had no clue what's going on. I had to start finding out what, you know, what was the disease and what was the uh, effect of the disease. I think I did that for six months. How did dialysis change your day to day? Obviously, we've talked about you, you ride a motorcycle. Did you have to stop riding your motorcycle? What changed with your job? How did it change your life every day? It was a dramatic change. After uh, doing a dialysis at the dialysis center, they gave me the option to do peritoneus dialysis. So they said, you're young, this is probably the way to go. And when I was in the dialysis center, the uh, person that was taking care of me there, she happened to be a dialysis kidney transplant person. Oh, wow. Yeah. So she said, I spent so much time here, I figured I can learn and I wanted to help other people. And she was on her second kidney transplant. Oh, wow. And she told me all the ins and outs about peritoneus, with the goods, the bads. You know, she was a lot of help, and I made my decision from there. It'll free me up a little bit because I can do it while I'm at night while I'm sleeping. For folks who might not be familiar, peritoneal dialysis is one you can do at home, correct? Correct. Yeah, they actually insert a tube through your stomach, and you hook up the machine to that, and you add the solutions and stuff like that. It was good because it was getting really stressful and hard for me to to work. And then for four hours, I had to go sit there. By the time I get home, I was only getting six hours of sleep because I had to be up at 3.30 in the morning to go to work. So it was really putting a drain, really making me fatigued and tired. And I got sick a lot, throwing up, stuff like that. Sometimes I couldn't even get out the bed. I was so, so fatigued. But I moved on and I kept going because, you know, like anything else, the bills don't stop. You know, I have to keep going. And that was my main focus. You know, I'm a, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a I'm a provider, you know, that's how I was raised. Take care of your family. Like Tracy mentioned, I'm a I'm a certified master electrician. So I did a lot of side work, you know, so that had to stop. I couldn't do that anymore. So that was a big hit on our income. The peritoneus that the, it was perfect for me because it let up time for me to go to work, what I need to do. And yeah, it, it slowed my my motorcycling down sometime. We were getting ready to go the next day. I really try to push myself because, you know, I wanted to keep my wife happy. It's affecting her too. This disease is affecting her almost as much as it's affecting me because she's by my side through the whole time. So she helped me through a lot of it. And of course she researched it and she knows doctors and she asks a lot of questions and she was my nurse. She was my everything. And when somebody asked me before, how is it to be on on dialysis, I said, you might as well tie an anchor and put a two foot chain, strap it to your leg. And that's what your limitations, you know, that's as far as you can go. I really hated it, (laughs) but I had to do what I had to do. What did you know about transplants before you were on dialysis and before your diagnosis? I think what most people know, what you see on the news and what you hear and, you know, that they take a part from somebody else and they put it in you, you know, and that's about it. That's all I knew. Never knew anybody else who had a transplant, nothing in my family. And I have a huge family, but nobody was ever affected by that. So I'm like, well, you know, is it hereditary? Is it something I'm doing? Is it something I'm eating? I don't smoke. I don't drink. You know, I don't do drugs. I don't do any of that stuff. And I had other issues prior to that. I had a heart condition. I had a heart attack at 42 years old. I was overweight. Back then I smoked. I'm six foot three. So my heart was running on full, full boat. I, I worked 12, 14, 16 hours a day, but that's what you did. You know, that's what we were taught to do. That's what we did. I had those issues. I got a hip replacement. I got a knee replacement and I have an ankle replacement from an accident back in the nineties while I was working. Oh my goodness. So not only I deal with that all the time, then this happened. So, and this was out of all that stuff that happened, this was worse. I would have traded that day Alice back in. And put the cast back on me up to here, you know, to my chest. I really have done that because I know eventually that'll heal. Tracy, what were you feeling during all of this when his, with his diagnosis and the dialysis? Uh, shock. Like it was very um, shocking, but help mode. Okay, let's go. Let's do this. Let's go to the doctor. Go to the hospital. Get you on dialysis. Find a dialysis center. You know, let's start right now. You know, there's no... We have to start now. It was a bit overwhelming, but there was no stopping getting the help that he needed. And I wasn't going to stop that. I was going to do everything I can 
to find the help that he needed, the doctors that he needed, the dialysis centers that he needed. You know, I researched what peritoneal dialysis was, you know, what he needed to do, the surgery that he needed to do to get that done. I was trying to stay on top of it, stay strong for him because he had enough to deal with and enough burden with this disease on him and then trying to provide for us. And I have to be the strong one, you know, staying strong for him. That had to be hard on you to put your own fears and worries aside. I mean, to see the person you love go through this and you have to set all that aside so that you can be the rock. Absolutely. You you really do. But I would do anything for him. Well, let me tell you, she was definitely the rock. Just to give you an example, out of all that, I was going a little, I was a little depressed. I was going through all kinds of emotions and she just stayed strong. So the day that I walked into this door after my kidney transplant is when she finally just broke down crying from all the stuff that she went through for all those, those years of taking care of me. She finally like let it out. You know? So let's talk a little bit about the transplant. Tracy, you decided you wanted to donate your kidney to Tony. Mm-hmm but you found out you weren't a match. What did that feel like? That was horrible. That was very sad. I thought for sure, you know, I was going to be a match. I I just thought in my mind, like, I had a feeling I was going to be a match. I knew it. I just, we were meant for each other. And I felt like we were going to be a match. The nurse called me and said, I'm sorry, but you're not a match. I, I started crying right away. I just started crying right away. But then she was like, no, 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 wait it's okay. It's okay. There's another option. Yeah. She thought hope, all hope. Yeah. She thought, she thought that was it, you know, and we'll have to do with this the rest of our lives. Yeah. And then they told us about the peritoneus program. Yeah. The kidney pair donation program. And I didn't know anything about it. And I said, yes, I didn't even research it. I've never heard it before. I just automatically said, yes, yes. And she's like, well, okay, well, let's discuss it a little more. And I'm like, oh, there's nothing to discuss. <laughs> Just yes. <laughs> Whatever so, it takes. Yeah, exactly. So with the paired donation, you, for people who don't know, you, Tracy, will donate your kidney to someone you've maybe never met before. And in exchange, Tony would get a kidney from their donor, sort of a swap. How do you find the match? There's lots of testing that it it entails. I had to go through vigorous tests, lots of blood tests, EKGs, stress tests, urine tests, and then they take all these tests and they contact the UNOS program, Mm -hmm. the UNOS system, and they put it in the system and they take the blood work and the antidotes or antibodies and test to see if there's any matches that match my antibodies for the person that needs a kidney and they put it in this UNOS program. And then if there's a match, they reach out to me to let me know. And then I have to go through some more testing to make sure that there's a match. And then that person has to go through ma- they send matches. Kit. They send me a, another kit, but every month I would have to go and get blood work done consistently to make sure that my blood matched for these recipients. Okay. How long did that process take from the time they tell you there's this other option, this paired donation? It's really strict program. You have to have your body weight has to be on point, your health, yeah. uh, you can't smoke, you know, there's so much factor. So that limits the donation. But of course, you want a nice, healthy kidney. Keep this in mind too, when you guys are talking about it, there was no stopping her. Yeah. Because right away, I'm thinking, I, I can't ask you to do that. You know, my kid stepped up and I said, I can't take it from you because this might be an inherited. You might get this, you know, and you're going to need everything to fight. So I can't. But there was, I mean, I'd say no. She says yes. No. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah. She's a woman I, on a mission. Yes. Oh, yeah. I had to stay healthy and I worked out. I had to have a healthy lifestyle in order to have a healthy kidney. My BMI had to be at a certain level in order to be able to give my kidney. And I made sure of that. There was no way that I was not going to have anything for them to tell me you cannot do this. 
I don't want to hear that you can't do this again because that was very devastating when they told me that I wasn't a match. And for them to say, no, that this can't happen, I, I didn't want to hear that again. So you finally get the call that they found a match. What did you know about your recipient and Tony's donor before surgery? Nothing. There was nothing. nothing. But we did get a call prior to that. Yes, we did get a call prior to that, that they found a, a, a match and I needed to go again right away. And, and they sent me a kit and I needed to get my blood work right away. And so I went and got my blood work. And a week later, they said that my antibodies were too strong for the recipient. So the match didn't work. We have to put you back in the pool. And that was devastating because more, more to you than me, right? It was very <laughs> devastating for me because I was like, it could be another year before we find another match. And he had minimal time. The doctors told him it was he, so advanced. They gave me six years. They gave him six years. And we know nothing about this program. He could have been on this program for longer than six years and he doesn't have time to be on dialysis that long, you know, he has minimal time. So I was devastated that that match did not work because my antibodies were too strong for the recipient. So it didn't, it didn't work. So we had to go back in the pool. So that was another, another blow to us. So I was very heartbroken, but it was only for a month. We were grateful. They, Great. a month later, they called us and they were like, we found a match. So I didn't get my hopes up. We didn't get our hopes up this time. I was like, <laughs> well, let's wait. Let me go get my blood work done. Well, we kept it in secret, but we yeah. were, our hopes were up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't tell anybody. We were just like, okay, look, let's just go get my blood work done right away. And so I got my blood work done. And then a week later, they're like, it is good. You are good to go. And they scheduled the surgery they schedule it for six weeks. So I, we knew we were good to go once they told us. Uh, one thing they did tell us too was, even though there's a match, you know, that was a match for, for me, I believe. And they said it could take a few more couples to get everybody paired up. Yeah. So they can, yes. you know, they said, so that might prolong, but the first step was to find me and then we find them, so, you know, somebody. So that was, yeah. uh, we are like, okay, how, you know, how long that could take? They said that could take a while trying to pair everybody, you know, up. But we did not know where it was coming from until they sent us the kit. And the kit stated Arizona. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's where we were like, they must be from Arizona. We didn't really know okay. anything until, I mean, the day we met them almost. Right? Yeah, almost. They want to make sure if anybody needs to back out or has to back out, they nobody's too involved, I guess, yet. Right, so. which is understandable, you know. Yeah. Yeah, they told us yeah. that, too, that up to the time that they get on the table, they can back out. Right. Mm -hmm. so, right. Yeah. But, you know, people who donate part of their body, they're not that kind of people, you know. They're big-hearted. and They're amazing people. You know, you're taking a part out of your body and giving it to somebody else. Yeah, I don't think I've ever heard a story of anybody backing out. They're all like Tracy. I've made up my mind. This is what I'm doing. Nobody's stopping me. Right. <laughs> so they're in Arizona. How did that work logistically, getting kidneys across the country? Well, let me tell you something. The hospitals and the people at Advocate, the way they coordinated everything, we're supposed to go all at the same time. So the two donors, the way they explained it to me, doctor says, I say, okay, we're ready. The other doctor says, yes, we're ready. Okay, let's go. And they both go. In this case, they couldn't do that because of the different, the time difference. So there's 30 hours that that kidney, before it's considered a cadaver kidney, there's 30 hours that they have to get it to you and put it in you so that because it's still alive. So a lot of coordination, they were going to use commercial planes, but in this case, they had to use charter plane. Oh, that seems scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm glad they got it on a charter yeah. plane. Yes. I could just imagine trying to coordinate this with two doctors and the surgeons. And from that from that end, from here, the time difference. My doctor, he took her kidney in the morning. And I think they came and got me like at 9 o'clock at night. 
Yeah, mine was at seven o'clock in the morning. His is wasn't until yeah nine o'clock at night, and it was ended at midnight the next day. What was surgery day like? If you're both in surgery at the same day, that had to be kind of nerve wracking. Yeah. Yeah, but lucky enough, it wasn't at the same time. So I was with her. So she went first. I was able to be there when she got out, make sure she was okay. I wasn't going to do anything until I seen her. And I was assisted about that. I had to make sure she was okay. So what was recovery like since you had both just been undergone major surgery? Who took care of you? Normally, you'd take care of each other, but who took care of you this time? I have a wonderful, amazing mother who's very supportive, and she was here the whole time taking care of us. She was. She is amazing. So she stayed with us for almost two weeks. And she was right back up doing her thing in a week. Yeah. Not even a week. Yeah, recovery for me was painful at first, of course. You know, I just had an organ removed from me. (laughs) It was painful and I couldn't, you know, of course, lift anything and I needed to rest and stuff. But my son was here. We have a son. He's enlisted in the Navy. So he's stationed in San Diego. And of course, he came home the um, whole time. The whole time. So he was here as well with us for a week. So we had our son here with us and my mother. So we definitely had support. And we have a daughter too. And she lives in Florida now, but she was here as well. We have a lot of support. Tony, how's your health now? How are you feeling post-transplant? Let's put it this way. The people at work, you know, I told you I have a hip replace. I have a little bit of a limp. But the guys, two people were like, everything okay? I'm like, why? No, they thought there was a fire or something because they said I was darting across the parking lot. You know, they've seen (laughs) me go so fast. My energy level went from here to here. In two months after I got the kidney, I mean, it was it's ama- it was amazing, you know, and I didn't realize it. And I just I was very anxious. I wanted to go. I wanted to get back to work. You know, do what Tony does. Even now, I want to go to the gym. We always were gym people. I want to go to the gym. I want to you know lift at eighty pounds and stuff like that, but I can't. I got to stay at thirty pounds. It's amazing, and it's almost like it didn't happen. So when we came home, first thing we did was get rid of all that stuff. Because it consumes your house. It consumes it. We have Dallas boxes in the basement. We have them upstairs. We have our, my, our bedrooms look like a, like a hospital room. Mm -hmm. We had this with hoses everywhere and buckets and needles and this and that. It was, it was actually depressing. Right. So that was the first thing to, to start healing was, okay, let's get these reminders out of here. I mean, we got them out of here quick. Everything went so well is that they told me that I was going to keep the tube in for like three weeks after, just in case, or if I need to have a dialysis treatment. So when I got up after surgery, it was gone. So I was scared. I'm like, what's going on? You know, did it not happen? Something happened? What? And the doctor came in. He said, that kidney, I put it in. It went right to work. <laughs> so there was no need to uh, leave that tube in. So I took it out. And I was like, oh, my God. Thank you. Yeah. You know? Yeah, so I got a great, healthy kidney. Wonderful. So what do you know about your donor and recipient now? Everything. Yeah. Yeah. They're we're, wonderful. We're, we're family now. Yeah. We're brothers and sisters. Yeah. You know? And they are a brother and sister pair, correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So look, you think about that. A sister couldn't give her brother a kidney. You know, they're related. Same blood, and they couldn't. Because from what I understand, it's hard for Hispanics and Blacks to pair from what I was understand, but I could be wrong, but that's what I was told. I think it's 49% of people that are on the list are black and Mm -hmm. Hispanic. Yeah. The doctor told us that uh, to get a couple to sibling, let alone a couple to just pair up where hers was perfect for him and his sister was perfect for me. Yeah. You know, they said that's like you get hit by lightning or something, hitting a lotto or something like that. So usually it takes multiples. It kind of sounds like your origin story where you just knew this is your person. Your kidneys just knew this is the match for us. This is the, these two are going to match these two perfectly. That's amazing. So the first match that we were called upon, it wasn't meant for us. Yeah, That's how I look at it, that it was not meant for us. And the people in Arizona, the brother and sister, they were meant for us. That's how I look at it. They were meant for us. They were meant to match with us. 
it happens for a reason. The, our stories are identical. You know, he's a big yeah. guy like me. He's a big motorcycle guy, fishing guy. Drives the same truck. Oh, I wow. Yeah. Yeah, and drives the same motorcycle. Oh, I do. They have a lot in common. You know, so, <laughs> was... And me and Tracy, we're nine years apart. So our brother and sister were apart the same, of the same oh, age. They yes. Were, yeah, I think he was 44, uh -huh. and she's 53. Wow. Yes. So she is my age, and I think when you do this program, you got to be within five years or something like that. So to find a brother and sister that far apart, mm -hmm. I'm sure it ain't that hard to find a couple that far apart, but to match us, you know, they had to be that far apart to match, you know, match us. Yeah. So that's amazing in itself. Every time I think about it, I'm like, wow. Yeah, you know? it's truly amazing how we just all paired up and we have all the similarities. It really is. It sounds like you literally could be family. Exactly. Yeah, we are and now. we are now. We are family now. <laughs> yeah, I was just talking to him yesterday. <laughs> yeah. So have you met in person? No, not no, yet. not yet. We, uh, but... we met at the hospital through a Teams program, you know, telecom, like the way we're doing now. Yeah. yeah. So that was the first time we've seen them, they've seen us. Mm -hmm. So. But we plan on going out there to visit them, maybe on our motorcycles too. Yeah, it sounds like you can all go on a motorcycle trip together. How has your relationship shifted since the transplant? You know what? It's it's funny because we were so busy with all this goings on. You're taking care of me. I'm struggling. I'm doing what I do, whatever. And once it was all over, that relief just got off our shoulders. And it's funny because we kind of both were like, it's like we fell in love again, you know? We were already in love. Right. We've been together this long, but... Let's put it this way. She's my wife, and if I needed to cut my arm off to save her, give me a butter knife, whatever I can get, because I'm, I'm going to do it. But the difference is she did do it. <laughs> she did do it. She did take a part. I can say I can do this. I cut my head. I can, I'll do whatever I need. She didn't say it. She did it. She took a piece of her body out so that I can be around longer. You know, and we can have a, you know, better life. So how do you not fall in love with that again? I mean, that showed me, man, this lady loves me. <laughs> this lady loves I know she loves me. We've been together 25 years. But this lady loves me. She did what anybody would say they do, but she did it. <laughs> you know, I understand uh, Frank and his sister, because they're brother and sister, you know. But we met at work. 25 years ago and after 25 years she didn't even think twice of giving me that kidney didn't think twice and i you couldn't stop her you know i'm a six foot three 280 pound guy it works out i'm tattooed i ride a motorcycle and she looked right in my face like i was this big and said <laughs> no this is getting done you know this is getting done i love you just getting done as all this went by and after it and we settled in, I mean, this was not even long ago, I look at her different now. Mm -hmm. I look at her with more love. I look at her as I cannot take none of this for granted because I've been taking taking her for granted. I got to let her know I love her every day. I got to let her know how beautiful she is. I got to let her know I want to come home to her every day, you know, that I want to spend the rest of my life with her. Because... She gave me more life to spend with her. You've got me and Tracy tearing up here. <laughs> I can't even, I can't even respond after that. <laughs> I think the kidney was your response. <laughs> yeah, and I know those people. Yeah, I know we did the trade and everything, but this is Tracy's kidney, you know, because yeah. I wouldn't have it without her. So yeah. I carry her with me. Literally carry her with me. So, <laughs> you know, without her, I wouldn't have got this one. So, yeah. What are you two looking forward to doing now that you're not, you don't have that anchor in the two foot chain? You are, you've got this freedom now that you have this transplant. What are you looking forward to doing? You want to answer Traveling. <laughs> <laughs> now I got what, seven months, I think it is. Yeah, we have so. Before I can, like, travel and stuff like that. They said, you know, they want to keep me close just in case something happens. 
And, you know, getting into a plane now is like getting into a petri dish of germs or something. So. Right. So we wait. It's okay. We waited this long. We, we'll wait a little bit longer. Yeah. So. We love to travel. We like to go to places. We like to see things. That's our thing. And that's what we plan on doing after all this. What words of encouragement do you have for those in your shoes? Tracy, those who are like, they love someone who needs a transplant and maybe they're not a match or they're unable to donate for some reason. What words of encouragement do you have for them? You have to stay positive. Because there is hope and there are people out there, you'll find a match. You have to stay positive because I truly, truly believe that if you think negative and you think down, it will happen. It will happen. But if you think positive and if you pray, it will happen. I truly believe that. And Tony, what words of encouragement do you have for people who are waiting for their gift? You know, I was lucky enough to have my person, you know, that helped me get through this. I could only imagine if I had to deal with this by myself. But there's so many programs out there that I didn't know about that will help. Thank you to Tony and Tracy for sharing their powerful story with us. And thank you to Jolie Sanders and Frank Pompa for participating in the swap. There are more than 3,400 people in Illinois waiting for a kidney transplant and living donors like Tracy can help decrease that number. To find more information about organ donation and transplants, visit our website at nkfi.org. I'm Sarah Jane Castro, and this is The Journey Continues. Prevention is a key part of our mission at NKFI. That's why at the end of each episode, Dr. Melissa Prest offers a health or nutrition tip. Here's today's nutrition tip about weight management. People live in bodies of all shapes and sizes. While body mass index, a measurement of your weight to your height, and ideal body weight ranges may or may not be appropriate for you. They are used as a guide to know if you're at risk for developing a chronic health condition. Many people may think weight management is about being on an overly restrictive diet that includes intensive exercising. This actually sets people up for failure and is a large reason why diets don't lead to maintained success. What weight management is about is learning how to make healthy food choices at home and when dining out. It's about learning how to identify when you're hungry or if you're eating for emotional reasons. It's about finding physical activity that allows you to move through a range of motion, strengthens your muscles, and gets your heart pumping. And it's about making choices that will help you maintain your weight or allow you to gradually reduce your weight. It may seem easy to go it alone, but research shows that those who find support and professional guidance are most successful. Here are some tips from people who have had success with weight maintenance. Exercise is important and build up to 200 to 300 minutes per week. This is the equivalent of 30 to 40 minutes a day of activity. Stay hydrated, drink lots of water, and limit sugar-sweetened beverages. Eat whole nutritious foods and focus on foods that are high in fiber. Eat responsibly and mindfully. Pay attention to when you're hungry and when you're full. Plan your meals ahead of time. This allows you to stay on track and make healthful choices. Find fun recipes online or in cookbooks to expand your meal variety. Decrease your screen time and do not eat while distracted. Monitor yourself by keeping a food log, measurements, or weighing in once a week. Join a weight management program for education and support. Build your own support group with family and friends. Keep a positive attitude and believe in yourself and your abilities. Think for the long term. The habits you are creating should be long sustaining and not quick fix. And make those changes gradual so that you can stick with them over time. With today's nutrition tip, I'm Melissa Prest, a registered dietitian nutritionist and the foundation dietitian for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois.